My friends, the great experiment. It's not what I was expecting. Hit it. Trick. Trick. Would you look at that? The greatest trick. Trick. Did you people, you're all astronauts. Are some kind of star trick. Trick. The greatest trick. Welcome to Greatest Trek. It's a new Star Trek podcast from the makers of The Greatest Generation. I'm Ben Harrison. I'm Adam Pranica. Ben, this year, 6,500 failing Star Trek podcasts nationwide. (laughs) We'll stop broadcasting after only a couple of episodes. They'll think it'll be fun to have a Star Trek podcast. But if things don't change soon... Mm, That could happen to us, too. (laughs) Greatest Trek in Los Angeles, California, will become just another statistic. (laughs) Uh, Is there a science to Star Trek podcasting? People ask me all the time, how do I get into podcasting? How do I become successful at podcasting? Do you know how disappointing it is to tell them that like, there really isn't a secret besides doing the work? Like, You put out episodes... The same day every week, the same time every week. Right. You try to make them fun to listen to. That's it. A a lot of the rest is luck. Yeah. Yeah. That's not science. No. That was really the premise of Bar Rescue in its earliest episodes was like that like motif where they cut to the like blueprint graphic and we'll show something mm-hmm. like there's always like the a little bit of like jargon from the industry or like uh you know you design things with this color lighting to make drinks look better or something yeah yeah i feel like uh by the time they got to season four they were like really out of ideas for bar science <laughs> by the time they got to the 58 episode season four i was shocked by this when i went to find this episode God, they've made a lot of episodes. I don't know if you did the same thing I did, but I saw that it was it was listed as episode 25 on the app that I used. But I was like, oh, like, so I'm here looking at the first several episodes of season four. I'm going to save myself some time and go to season five and then click left to get back to it faster. And then I was like, this is further from where yeah. I was trying to go. Yeah, <laughs> you're in it at that point. <laughs> ben, I really don't watch or care for much reality television, but for some reason, Bar Rescue has stuck with me, and it's because of you. <laughs> Sorry. You got me interested in this show, and I'm wondering why you like it so much. What's your origin story with Bar Rescue? Um, I've been off bar rescue a lot lately though this very much felt like a uh, peeled a scab and i'm now going to be back in it yeah um i think it's the sheer audacity of it how silly it is as a show like yeah it is like 10 out of 10 on the sincerity rating like there's zero irony in it like John Taffer does not really do jokes or bits or anything. Yeah. They always try and like work in a really intense like reconciliation between father and son or daughter and brother. There's always some like really intense shit like that. But also everybody on the show is like usually just like catastrophically bad at their jobs. I mean, the headline for the show is John Taffer yells at people. But you get a scene every episode where Taffer sits down with the two bar owners and you see his big, wet, basset hound eyes. And he's like, guys, I just really care about you. Yeah. Putting it together. He can hang teardrop with the best soap opera actors. He really can. Yeah. And that's an amazing skill. Like anybody that I've ever talked to that is actually in the bar industry is like, he is a menace, he's a fool. (laughs) The designs that he comes up with are insane. They don't like him? No, nobody likes him. (laughs) Oh, that's impossible, come on. I'm a fan of his vibe, but I don't think that it like really hits for people. I don't embrace excuses, I embrace solutions. A bar and a restaurant seems like one of those businesses that anyone thinks they can run. Right, right. And that I think has a great appeal to a lot of television viewers like, oh, 
these guys are idiots. Like, look at how they're running this place in the ground. And and Taffer comes in and like gives them the justice that you would by yelling at them and, and getting them to ship up, shape up, and ship out. I think that the most amazing thing about the show is that John Taffer is such an alpha and is positioned as such an alpha by the fact that he is the guy with the TV show that has the resources to come in and like change the direction. You can ricochet off bar rescue into a whole new trajectory. If, if that is a trajectory of success, I feel like is very much an open question, but it, like your business will never be the same if you convince them to come do a week at your premises, right? Yeah, if if the baseline is something's got to change around here, this is going to work. But like so often the reason nothing is changing is because there's some fucking shitty dude who is like A, an alcoholic and B, has a giant ego the size of a planet and never listens to anyone. And John Taffer is like one of the few people in the world that is able to break those people down and and get them to like bend the knee and humble themselves a little bit. And that's always an amazing project to watch be undertaken. He's the ego whisperer, isn't he? I have no idea how much this is staged or not, but yeah, the combination of that secret sauce with the fact that every episode is identical yeah, and like you can start watching in the middle and it doesn't really matter. you like, you'll get everything out of it. You can watch while playing a game on your phone and you're not missing anything. <laughs> you're right. It's background noise television, you know? The the bar rescue format is one of the things that makes it comfort programming. Well, it's become comfort programming to me. I'm not allowed to watch it late at night. <laughs> but for many, it is that. And the reason we're doing this episode of Bar Rescue is because of a all too brief appearance by Alexander Siddig. He's in the episode and plays an important role in it. He's not a big part of it. No. But we really wanted to do a bar rescue episode <laughs> for Greatest Trek Spring Break. So here we are. Yeah. Are we in the middle of spring break yet? Oh, yeah. Sure are. It's week four. Right smack dab in the middle of Greatest Trek Spring Break. We're, we're running downhill from here. I'm really excited to get into season four, episode 25 of Bar Rescue, Broke Down Palace. So the format for Bar Rescue always starts with an introduction to the background of the bar that we're visiting for that episode. So back in 2013, Ghazi and his brother-in-law, Sam, bought this restaurant, and neither of them have restaurant experience. <laughs> the problem with this business is that Ghazi is, is socializing and giving away drinks at the bar, and that the bar has never broken even since it's opened. It loses $10,000 a month and is $650,000 in debt. Out of desperation, they have agreed to pull back the doors, bust open the books, and make a call for help to Bar Rescue. So we are in Upland, California, which is like Inland Empire, well east of Los Angeles. And this is a Moroccan-themed bar called The Palace. I thought for sure, based on the little sizzle reel at the beginning before the title package, that a big contentious issue with this bar was going to be like ventilation and hookahs and fire safety because right. they show people like walking around with like hot coals in like kitchen sieves. Like for some reason, like they'll come out to your table where you're doing hookah at this Moroccan bar with like the like that cone shaped sieve that you see chefs like like drying pasta off in <laughs> full of fucking like red hot coals the footage shows like embers like falling onto the carpet and like the sieve like near patrons arms and stuff it's like for sure taffer is going to absolutely go off the handle at how fucking dangerous this place is from a fire safety standpoint that that carpet's got to look like the floor of the rio in vegas <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> instead I think you see hookahs in a couple more shots toward the beginning, but they never yeah. come up again. So brother and brother-in-law do not get along. Sam and Ghazi hold each other responsible for the failing bar. The service staff doesn't really get any direction from them and doesn't really have a lot of respect for them given their behavior. Yeah. And the fact that Ghazi and Sam hate each other 
Seems like it's going to be a big part of this episode. Ghazi runs like the front of the house. He is the bar manager, I guess, and Sam runs the kitchen. Neither seems to know particularly much about either role. Ghazi gets a lot of shit from Sam because he gives away tons of free drinks. Uh, The food appears to be very bad, but uh, Sam does not seem to get that much shit from Ghazi over that because I think maybe Ghazi is too drunk to notice. (laughs) You get one of the great moments of any bar rescue episode, the pull up in the black suburban Mm -hmm. outside. And this is where Taffer watches on a iPad video footage of what's going on in the restaurant slash bar he's there to fix. There's a shot in every episode of this show that absolutely cracks me up, which is the like, we've hidden cameras around the restaurant and it cuts to a swivel camera that they've mounted somewhere and then like taped black gaff tape all over to like make it. I, I'm guessing that this camera is white out of the box and they tape it up with black gaff tape to make it stand out a little bit less. You know those cylinders that you pour concrete in to make pilings under a deck? Like that's how <laughs> giant the <laughs> these periscopes are hanging from the ceiling. They're so big. <laughs> yeah. It's incredible. And they're kicked too. Like they are reused over and over again. Yeah, like the tape is still on from season two, episode 35, you know. We're using this 12 inch diameter cardboard form and I've simply cut it with a circular saw. It should be said at some point during this episode, production on reality shows are some of the hardest working people in all of television. Like they work so hard. The hours are so long. They totally kick ass. Like the people that I know that have shot reality, like their bodies break under the pressure of this production. It's brutal. It's uh, very much an industry that needs a lot of uh, help from the unions because many of these productions are not unionized. And so the hours are like totally insane. And like Bar Rescue almost makes a point of pride of how insane the hours are because they literally work construction crews like 36 hours straight to to do these fucking like right. half-assed bar rebrands but um yeah so we we meet the uh the experts that are helping john with this bar we've got a stone cold classic in the mix adam it's mia mastriani with her unique ingredients and original cocktail recipes mia really knows how to stir up a crowd the head mixologist of the soho house in west hollywood have you been to Soho House with Hollywood? I have not. I've been to the Soho House uh, downtown, which is really nice. I caught my first COVID there, I believe. Oh, fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I've ne- never been to the West Hollywood one. Oh, uh, that would be fun. Yeah. She's like a total regular on this show. And then a chef that I had never seen on this show before... Penny Davidi. Her innovative spin on Mediterranean dishes is exactly what this bar needs. And Penny Davidi has another reality show connection, Adam. She is the head chef of Pump, Lisa Vanderpump's bar in West Hollywood also. You watch that reality show, right? Is she on that show? I've never seen her before, Okay, uh, as far (laughs) as I know. Pump is kind of like a tertiary location on that show. Like hmm. most of it takes place at Sir. Yeah, okay. And like I don't know anything about like her actual skills of a chef. I I one time read a review of Lisa Vanderpump's Restaurant Empire as the three worst restaurants in Los Angeles. <laughs> 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 Sounds great. I've never actually eaten at any of them, so I don't. I, don't, I can't sign off on either of these people from sure. personal experience. But she's specifically a Mediterranean food specialist, and that's right. the reason for being there. One of my absolute favorite like graphics treatments in this episode is when they explain where Morocco is. <laughs> Morocco is a country in North Africa. <laughs> Morocco's prime location has made it a central trading post for both Europe and the Middle East. (laughs) Oh, really? (laughs) And they show it on a map. (laughs) There's a version of that that goes like, this voiceover is going to talk about Africa. (laughs) (laughs) It's great. John Taffer blesses the rains down in Africa. He's going to take some time to do the things he never had. This is a moment where the three of them just watch a sizzle reel of Ghazi and Sam arguing the whole time. And that precedes one of the great moments of any Bar Rescue episode, the the recon. 
And here's where we get to catch up with Alexander Siddig and Ido Goldberg, who in a fun bit of network synergy were shooting a Spike TV miniseries called Tut. And Bar <laughs> Rescue was on Spike TV back in the day, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's one of those shows that's jumped around a bunch. It was on like the Paramount Network for mm-hmm. a while. I think it was on maybe FXX or did like Esquire or like FHM or something have a TV yeah. network for a little while? You could see this being at home on so many networks. Or maybe that's what Spike was. It was like, it's TV for men. <laughs> it was like the pitch. <laughs> One of my favorite details of this episode that is never commented on is that Alexander Siddig and Ido Goldberg emerged from a star wagon to do their recon. <laughs> and I'm like, did they park a fucking star wagon in the parking lot of this restaurant so that they could have a chill before going in? I feel like this was like a contractual obligation, but like- I love this. They contracted at each other. Yeah. <laughs> like Siddig and, and Goldberg were like, okay, we'll fucking do- your fucking bar rescue. We'll go out to Upland, California for a night yeah, and pretend that we're friends with John Taffer. We will have two terrible martinis. <laughs> <laughs> but like, we're not doing it if you don't get us a trailer. And it's got to be the kind that like has the bump out, like the yeah. section that like yeah. telescopes from the side to make it even bigger. I've not been interested in asking a Q&A question at a convention of Alexander Siddig yet. <laughs> but after watching this episode, I want to be like, uh, yeah, I've got a question for Alexander Siddig about his appearance on Bar Rescue, season four, episode 25, Broke Down Palace. Did you actually negotiate a star wagon for yourself? <laughs> And uh, did you have your own, or did you have to share it with Ido you know, Goldberg? Like, did you guys each get your separate <laughs> wagons? Was that part of the deal? Get a life. This is so great. So this is like promoting Tut that's coming yeah. right up because they are fresh back from having shot in Morocco for six months. So like, they're like, we know Mor- Morocco. Like, if we walk into this place and it's super authentic to Morocco, we're going to be able to tell you about it. Taffer meets them outside of the star wagon and and kind of preps them for the mission ahead. Yeah. And then we get another cutaway to a graphics and it's like, authenticity is when uh, <laughs> space has verisimilitude with the thing that it's themed after. <laughs> What follows is like pure reality television sequencing, right? We watch the scout and then we also get the talking head interview intercut with the scout to kind of bulk up the observations. Right. They give an earpiece to Ido Goldberg. They didn't have the budget to give one to Siddig, so he's more or less sidelined for the rest of his appearance on the episode. Why don't you two um, go on? Pretend I'm not here. An earpiece is a surreptitious way to communicate with someone outside your field of vision. I love how the scout starts. They both kind of saunter in there like, okay, let's start at the bar where there are no bar stools. There are no bar stools. I looked this place up. It, it seems like it. they renamed the place in the episode, but it seems like a place called the palace is still open in Upland. They didn't end up keeping the name. They changed it for this episode, and then they changed it back. Yeah, but uh, I was like clicking around on the pictures on Yelp, and they put bar stools in in this episode. They took them back out. Like what? This, this place went back to a no bar stools format. Why would you have a bar without bar stools? I I don't know what the logic is. And there's no drink menu either. That's the other thing. So they've got a bar full yeah. of liquor. No drink menu and no bar stools. No drink menu is an absolute classic bar rescue fail. Yeah. Siddig gets like some great slams in on how nasty the decor and vibe are. Yeah. This place is like the aftermath of a bad wedding. They walk up to the bar. They order a couple of vodka martinis. Uh, Siddig orders his with a twist. The bartender... She's like off to a terrible start. She's like shooting something from the bar gun into the tin that she's mixing the drink in. 
this is getting roasted by Mia Mastriani back in the in the suburban in the parking lot. One thing we should mention is that Alexander Siddig and also Ido Goldberg, but definitely Alexander Siddig are like world class, beautiful people. Like he looks so fucking great in there. How could you not want to serve him martinis as soon as he enters the room? Like your eyes just find him. Like how these two get ignored for their entire visit, I'll never understand. I can't figure that out either. Like they both speak with these incredibly fancy British accents yeah. also. And yeah. it's like not treated as remarkable. They're sat down and like, they're sipping their disgusting, super watered down martinis that don't have a twist. And like, they wait for like half an hour before a menu comes out. Kind of a lot is made of the ice cubes in the martini glass thing in the beginning as being a reason for the watered down martini. But you see this sometimes, like the chilling of the glass using ice. So I don't think yeah. that's necessarily a bad move, right? No, that's, uh, I mean, that's a good move. Yeah, I think. yeah. But uh, yeah, so like they ask for tagine. The waiter doesn't know what that is, <laughs> which I thought was amazing. Oh, no. <laughs> but they do have uh, a selection of appetizers that they order, I guess. And we cut over to the kitchen where we watch where the food gets made, and oh no, mm. the cross-contamination here. You could call Bar Rescue cross-contamination, I think, and right. tell a story about the entire series, because this is something that Taffer takes great umbrage with. Yeah, the uh, I don't know if it's lamb or ground beef or something, but the the cook is like handling a bunch of raw meat with his hands and then like touching all of the dishes that the falafel and like the fried dumplings and shit are, are getting put on and so like Chekhov's earpiece comes into play when Taffer like warns Siddig and you know, Goldberg away from eating any of the food that has been brought out to them because it's basically all contaminated with raw meat hand there are several moments in every episode where Taffer is moved to action and there is a way that he moves his body that is so unintentionally funny because <laughs> if you're sitting in the driver's seat of a Suburban and you want to leave that Suburban, Ben, you will reach over to the handle, pull the handle, swing the door open and leave. That would be a normal way to do that. Taffer uses his entire body to do this sequence. <laughs> what he needs is leverage. So he moves his body forward into the steering wheel and then back to pull the handle and then he moves his entire body out the door as it's opening in one unbroken <laughs> sequence. And then the archway of this restaurant, you don't always get this on a Taffer entrance, but he walks in there like he's entering the Royal Rumble. Like his name has been called and he's yeah. like doing the arm swing and his entrance music plays. It's amazing. He walks a bit like... A bit like Mussolini, <laughs> you know, like on time. He's got his head back a little bit when he comes in, yeah. just like just giving the hairy eyeball to the entire restaurant. He does this thing with like a almost every episode where he's criticizing the food. He just like puts his hands right in the food and starts like tearing it apart. And he like he'll like take a burger patty and like crumble it up in his hands and then hold it out with both hands and be like, would you eat this? There is a super cut. <laughs> in production for this show that is nothing but a server asking the two patrons, do you know this guy? <laughs> <laughs> As he's reaching his hands into their food. So he calls over Sam and Ghazi and just starts absolutely roasting them for the choices that they've made as restaurateurs and bar owners. You're both idiots! And this again, we're getting a lot of like on the fly interviews with them that we cut away from, like them saying how it felt to be roasted by Taffer. Lousy! Cut back to Taffer continuing to absolutely light them up. He like eventually takes them outside so that he can yell at them without the entire restaurant being distracted about it. Because people are in there eating and drinking and stuff. Mostly for free, it seems. Yeah. Ghazi just straight up walks out <laughs> of this moment in the parking lot. It looks like he's quit. It does. The major complaint so far, it sounds like the drinks were watered down, but not like violently disgusting. Sure. Whereas the food was like 
actively dangerous. Yeah. And yet, Ghazi, the bar manager, is the one that's getting the most shit here. And he's like, yeah, like, I got to give away tons of drinks because that's how you keep customers happy. And this is a, like, you're pouring your profits down the drain moment. And he winds up, like, stamping away. And it becomes a thing where Taffer is like, I will rescue your bar if you bend the knee. This is that moment. Like, the most pig-headed person has to admit that he was the one that was wrong. This is a moment where the commercial-free version of Paramount Plus really created some comedy because we cut directly from this moment into the next day, like early in the day. Yeah. And Ghazi's in a booth having gotten started early (laughs) with the booze and the hookah. The other thing that is absolutely baffling about this episode is that Ghazi and Sam are in the episode all day the next day having not changed shirts. Yeah, and even Taffer comments on this. You didn't have time to change? (laughs) Like, did they stay there boozing all night? Ghazi, you're in the same spot as last night. You could have at least changed your shirt. They call this all staff lineup meeting, and this is great, because Ghazi's made to prove that he was not blackout drunk last night. (laughs) (laughs) And he's like, Yeah, I remember some things about the loud guy being there yeah, and so forth. (laughs) He actually does a commendable job of of piecing stuff together. Like, he did not black out last night. He does remember some things. I wonder how they choose as a production what the all-staff meeting is going to be comprised of because they have this every time. This is a 7,000-square-foot bar restaurant that has like belly dancer, like it's got production every night. This is a fucking operation. And there are like four waitresses and three bartenders and a cook and the two owners present. Like I don't believe that this few people can run a place this size, even with as few customers as they have. Ghazi's attitude is a real problem here. And and like they do a thing where they like put a piece of tape down the middle of the room and they're like, if you want to if you want Sam to be the leader go to the Sam side, and if you want Ghazi to be the leader, go to the Ghazi side. This is just classic reality show game right here. Yeah. This doesn't seem to add up to anything. Like, I kind of wondered if they were going to try and put it into a place where it was like one of you is actually empowered to be the 100% control leader. Right. That's not what happens. And there's not a super clear break on the line, too. Like, some people go with Sam, some people go with Ghazi. But where there is a consensus among the whole group is that everyone thinks Ghazi's drinking is hurting the business. And while they don't have a consensus about which manager should be the manager, they do all agree about that. Yeah, Ghazi winds up having to admit that his leadership style and management has been backfiring in many ways. And it's interesting because like the on the flies with Taffer where he's talking about the situation. He's like, these guys are both fucking up, but Ghazi is way more pig headed about it. And like, at least Sam is admitting that he bears some, some fault. So you got a Dracula Taffer. Like that's a big part of this show. It's like, you got to want the help. You got to admit that you're fucking up. Yeah. So uh, Taffer, having extracted that humility from Ghazi, introduces his experts, Mia to teach the bar staff and Penny to teach the kitchen staff. And then he like switches up who's going to be in charge of which. Like Ghazi is going to be in the kitchen and Sam's going to be on the floor for the stress test, which is like, I'm never sure what the stress test is about. Like it's a part of every episode. It's always bad every episode. It's like, it's just basically like, what do we do to guarantee that they look like absolute fucking idiots yeah. in the middle of this so that we can have a redemption story by the end? What creates the biggest explosion is really the outcome you're going for here. So like they really try to stack the deck to really like crush them Yeah, in this, in this first night. Also, in this episode, because... The palace is such a big restaurant. They decide to have the stress test at a different restaurant. So they pick out a nearby German style beer hall in like a castle looking building. Yeah. With like swords and beer barrels on the walls. 
as where they're going to do their like a Middle Eastern restaurant relaunch stress test. It's a bar that I rescued called Steinhouse. And so they have to like move house to do that while like we're learning about basic ass shit for the staffs, like what harissa is. Harissa is a versatile ingredient that gives Moroccan food its distinct flavor. And how to mix a martini for the bar staff. I love the idea of like they're in a kitchen that usually prepares giant pretzels and schnitzel. And they're like, <laughs> where are we going to keep these olives and these other olives? <laughs> it just does not seem like a good place to do what they need to do, which presents another challenge. But it does give them the opportunity to sort of demonstrate the reason that the show exists and the reason that Taffer has the reputation he's got. Like, look. Steinhouse fucking sucked before Taffer got here. Yeah. And this guy, Mr. Stein, he hated Taffer. Like yeah. yelled at him and all that. And we see the footage. And now they're like hugging. And Mr. Stein is like, you guys just need to to prostrate yourself for Taffer here, because then you're gonna be making money hand over fist. Yeah. It seems like his restaurant is doing better since the super chintzy looking redesign and yeah. rebrand. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> The bar training session is where we get like the one piece of quote unquote bar science that they keep twanging on in this episode, which is the wash line. Yeah. Where the drink rises to in the glass. Right. Mia Mastriani is trying to teach this bar staff about that. But like when I worked in a restaurant, I worked in a one Michelin star restaurant. I was regularly tested on the menu. Like I was a fucking bus boy and I needed to know like what allergens were in dishes and mm -hmm. you know how things were prepared and stuff and like basically like they look at the staff as like everybody needs to like actually care about what we serve like the you have to like know what the product is even the bus boy needs to know this bar staff know less about this food and like food in general than i had to as a bus boy mm -hmm. And like, obviously like this was like a different caliber of restaurant. It's a different quality of product. But like, it really does make you think like, there's such like a weird like class cosplay thing that happens in restaurants where not all people, but a lot of people go into restaurants to pretend that they have servants, you know? Like I'm ordering these people to bring me things and they want to like order shit from people. And they need they need it to be like exactly what they want. And and that, like there's a side of this that's like I have allergies or I have like restrictions in my diet that I can't compromise on. But some people go in and are like, I want a cob salad, but I don't I want romaine lettuce and like I want black olives, but I you know, can you cut up an apple on top? And it's like it's about controlling people. Hmm. And I feel like a really good hospitality staff knows how to manage that kind of person and knows how to like set expectations for them. And the way you know how to do that is like, you know what drinks are, like you know like what the like social signifiers of a martini are and why somebody would order it a certain way and not another way. Do you think that's why we never get an interaction like that on this episode? Like there's never a moment where that information is conveyed by anyone on staff to anyone on the customer side. The waiter didn't know what a tagine was. Yeah. These people don't know anything about the food that they sell. They don't know anything about the drinks that they sell. Well, in that in that server's defense, they didn't sell tagine. Right. So he doesn't need to know about the thing they don't sell. Fair, but it would be <laughs> like a reasonable assumption at a Moroccan restaurant. <laughs> I love that. One of these test dishes is olives and pita. <laughs> you must pass the first test of making olives and pita. Yeah. Can you do it? We need to score a lot of Latin fast. Licensed businessman. The stress test starts and they in invite all of these SoCal yo-yos into the restaurant. There's lots of street parking, and if not, there's a coffee bean across the street that fully validates. The people that were in the restaurant on the first night, on the uh, surveillance night, were definitely like dudes that were friends with Ghazi. Mm -hmm. 
the people that they bring in for the stress test are like locals that saw something on Craigslist about like maybe getting free drinks and food, right? Is there enough for me? The drinks look like a problem right off the bat. And I don't know how you overcook pita, but it's definitely overcooked into like a cracker type consistency. Yeah. Ghazi is very dedicated to the idea that the pita looking good is the most important part. And so he's burning it because yeah. he feels like that's that's the, the best presentation thereof. And because they've switched front of house and back of house responsibilities, the conflict is supremely apparent between Sam and Ghazi here because- Sam would like nothing more than to make good pita, and Ghazi wants more than anything to be out on the floor. <laughs> Man, one of the things I don't like about this show is how mean they can be to the staff. You have the worst team we've ever seen. There's a bartender that's like routinely fucking up, and like, you know, in their defense, like she's been told several times how to grab the bottle by the neck to, to do pours, and she's grabbing it in insane ways that are anything but that. But also, like, she's had a day of training in the context of it being filmed for a reality show, and and you're fucking firing her over that? Yeah, I basically never want to watch a reality show where someone is driven to tears and leaving. And that that happens here, I think, constitutes the ugliest part of the episode. And really... The ugliest part of what this show represents sometimes is that kind of the drive away. Yeah. Like the people who should cry are Sam and Ghazi. Right. They, like the rest of the people are collateral damage to the story that they're trying to tell here. And I just don't think it's fair to to do that to them. This lady is probably making the like minimum wage of tipped staff. Yeah. And she's getting fucking humiliated on television because- yeah. Sam and Ghazi didn't fucking train her because they didn't know what the fuck they were doing. Yeah. Yeah, if anything, Sam and Ghazi should be made to look worse in this episode. Like, the worst of everyone should be them. Yeah, like, if Taffer really, like, believed what he reps, he would make them apologize to her at this moment. But you do that, and you make your pool of viable bar and restaurant projects dry up because no owner operator of a bar is going to want to be made to do that yeah. on a reality show. You know, that's the bad class structure of this symbiotic relationship of like bars in trouble and reality television. Like you need new bars to do this at. And if bad bar owners get the sense that they're going to be made to look really bad, they're not going to want to participate. Yeah, bars are for class cosplay, not for, like, actual class inversion. <laughs> right. Yeah, well put. So, needless to say, the stress test goes bad. They shut it the hell down. Folks, this bar is closed! This is actually a pretty good moment, because in the aftermath, they agree to all get trained together as long as they don't blame anyone for what got them in this position. Right. We're moving forward. We're, we're letting the past be the past. We're learning about what tagines are. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, like the the next day we like get get the new dishes from Penny and then Mia shows like some of the new drinks. This moment with the tagine, I feel like is made to be Padma and Anakin memed. Like, <laughs> because when, when Penny talks to Ghazi and his kitchen hench and, and she's like, now we all know what Moroccan food is, right? We all know what Moroccan food is, right? <laughs> like, I don't think they do. And I think it's very apparent that no one has asked the question of Sam Orgazi, like, ever been? Where are you from, originally? Uh, what do you like about the culture and stuff? Yeah. Or do you just like drinking and smoking hookah? <laughs> I would like to know that. I don't know if they are Moroccan or not. Their accents, I had a boss uh, in college who was Syrian and their accents were like very, very similar to his. So I, I sort of wondered if they were from over on that side of the Mediterranean mm -hmm. originally. Have you been to Morocco? No. I have. I know. It was like the Rick Steves day trip over there. Most visitors take a tour. 
day tripping in from Spain for a predictable series of experiences. My in-laws are, are planning a trip there, and then we're meeting them after in Europe, maybe. And I'm like, I'd rather just do the Morocco part. Absolutely. <laughs> I thought the tagine looked delicious. Yeah. I also thought that the cocktails they made looked delicious. There's like a, a like a pomegranate kind of martini situation with cardamom-infused pomegranate syrup. You're talking about the pomegazi, yeah. Ben, which, God, we just will not let that go <laughs> as a talking point, will we? Congressional investigation after congressional investigation and the pomegazi still in the cultural zeitgeist. I mean, this is a combination that hits with any kind of substitutions, right? A, a sweet and a sour and a spirit in, in equal pours, basically. But like really nice, nicely thought out flavors. And like the yeah. same thing with the fig and honey sour. Like they make a syrup with, with figs and honey. Like that's- That's something most people aren't going to make at home. And that's why those alternate syrups, I think, can make going out for cocktails a lot of fun. They sounded delicious to me. It's always very funny. Uh, I feel like especially early seasons of Bar Rescue, it's very obvious like which liquor conglomerate sponsored yeah. the episode because it's specifically Smirnoff and Crown Royal that they're using in these drinks. The fig and honey sour sounds really sweet just from its ingredients. Like for there to be syrup and Crown Royal, like Crown is a very sweet spirit as it is. I'd need more lemon juice, I think. Yeah, the the ratio is interesting though cuz it's not a 3-2-1, it's 2-1-1. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like I would maybe like up the lemon juice and back off on the fig and honey syrup right. on a drink like that. Yeah. I was going to make this cocktail for our record, but I couldn't find any figs. Oh man. Shit out of luck. I got a fig tree right here. You do? Not really in season though. Yeah. Damn. It grew as a weed in my mother-in-law's backyard. Like she had an empty pot full of dirt and a fig just sprouted in it. And she was like, hey, you want this? And I was like, fuck yeah. That is magic. Yeah. The special magic. Yeah. One of the cool things about Southern California. Another magical thing that happens in this very episode is the reconstruction of this restaurant. A activity we have not seen any of. There's often a moment where John like rolls a blueprint out on a big table and shows where things are going to be and what he's doing to, you know, reconfigure a space so that it's more effective. And I don't think that there's any of that here. Like the, the, the layout is staying the same and it's a redress of that room. I was also been totally lost on the median income within a 10 mile radius of this restaurant or like where the local highways might be in relation to it. Right. Like how many people drive past this location on a daily basis? We get none of that. Yeah. And that is a major through line on your average bar rescue episode, I'd say. This is a big bar and we have a lot of work to do. We also don't find out how much liquor waste is happening, like how much they're giving away. They don't do the surveillance of the pores. There's an interesting thing that happens conversationally when people talk about the amount of drinking that Ghazi's been doing. Yeah. Is that like they're losing $10,000 a month and someone mentions that they're pouring $10,000 away right. on free drinks. Right. But also, like, one of the fallacies of this show is that every drink you're giving away, you could be charging for. I mm -hmm. just do not believe that to be true. Like, no. I think a lot of people would just not get another drink if it wasn't free. <laughs> this just happened to me. I went to a tacos place around the corner from me, and they had a bunch of bottles of Mezcal on the bar next to the register. And I was like, we were just talking about Mezcal. And the guy pointed at one I'd never seen before. And I was like, how about you and I do a couple of samples of that? <laughs> and he's like, okay. <laughs> and so we had a couple of drinks together, just me and the and the guy behind the register. It was great. That rules. Off the ticket. I love it. You threatened him with a good time. I and did. He was uh, available for that threat. Absolutely. So no one's saying pour $10,000 of liquor into a customer's mouth, but- No. I think 
when you build up a relationship with a bar, that is often a very fun thing. That's like a milestone. I feel like yeah. when, when you've done your time at a bar, when you've earned it, I think that might be the main thrust of the argument against what Gazi's doing. It's like these, these fucking guys just walked in. You don't even know them. <laughs> yeah. Who knows if they'll be back? Then again, Gazi is clearly giving tons of free shit away all yeah. the time. But, uh, so we get to the next day, time for the big relaunch. John Taffer always gathers everyone in the parking lot so that they can turn around and see the place for the first time. This is where the star wagon was. Yeah. They moved it away so the construction vehicles could park there. I mean, the absence of the star wagon lays bare that Siddig and Ido Goldberg are not going to be returning for the the launch, which like- Do the scouts ever come back? They do sometimes, yeah. Damn, I really wanted that. I was very sad that they that they weren't uh, in the relaunch. But, but if uh, you only want to pay for a star wagon for one day, you know, that's how it's got to be. Obviously. Yeah. Everybody turns around. We see the new place. It's called Minara. I could not quite make out what this meant. There was an explanation to it, but it went over my head. Yeah, I looked it up. My wife came out. She'd been like, uh, I don't know, getting ready for bed or something and, and came out and watched the last 10 minutes of this episode with me. And she commented that it sounded just like menorah. Hmm. And we looked it up. And I think Menara is a lighthouse in Morocco. Hmm. And they have the same route. It was like it's like lantern basically hmm. you aren't afraid guys are gonna think it's marinara <laughs> people are expecting italian food you don't have any meatballs on the menu what are you doing <laughs> these meatballs are rock hard so uh we walk in, we get the reveal on the inside, we get lots of like before and after shots. This was when my wife was like, this is the after? Yuck. Oh, <laughs> come on. I love the fountain. An indoor fountain? Oh, that's great. The fountain was cool. They definitely just went to like a Lowe's and grabbed one and threw it in the back of a pickup truck and installed it in the middle of this room. I like... Even for a dumb like me, the explanation of the color palette, like, these colors are spices. Don't you recognize them? I was like, yeah, I do. One thing that absolutely blew me away when the camera lovingly scrolled past the menu, the cocktail menu that was, like, mounted on the wall. Oh, I did not like that. Like, this is something that Taffer always does, is he blows up the menu and makes it wall art. I do not like this choice at all. It looks like a fucking Orange Julius or something. Like, you don't need that. It's always a little corny looking. The thing that absolutely staggered me, every cocktail, Adam, $8.25. Wow. Wow. It's like cocktails, $8.25, and then a list of like six cocktails. I mean, this is a throwaway line, and I think Taffer says it, but people will spend 60% more in a well-themed bar. Yeah. A fact- Unsighted. <laughs> I, I want to know more about that. I feel like that's true to my experience. Is that to say like theme bars earn 60% more money than non-theme bars? Like how do you get to that figure? I mean, if I go into the Tonga room and I see a drink on the menu that's like 19 bucks, I'm like, give me that $19 fucking drink. Okay, so... So you're more likely to buy a $19 drink than an $8.25 drink because it's a theme bar. I think so. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I also think that uh, they are, yeah, like this is 2015. Mm -hmm. Were there really places that were charging $8.25 for a full-size cocktail in 2015? I think we got to get up to Upland, California and, and yeah. see what's what. We got to go on a little field trip. Yeah. Uh, POS Terminal's been uh, just a classic upgrade to any bar on yeah. this show. I don't know how they were doing it before if they didn't have terminals. But if you don't have menus, you don't really need terminals. Like, what are you supposed to enter in there? Yeah, what are you ringing up even? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> comp drink, comp drink, comp drink, comp drink. It's like one one button on the POS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the till is empty at the end of the night I don't know why 
Uh, <laughs> Are we giving away money too? Yeah. <laughs> there is so much optimism, Ben, before doors, right? Yeah, they have bar stools. That's great. They've got uh, wallpaper that looks like Moroccan tiles. That's great. They've got menus. It's uh, it's just grins and smiles all around. Everybody's so excited. I mean, more than that, one aspect that I loved were people running and screaming into the restaurant as if the parking lot was on fire or something. Yeah. One of the things about the like one company sponsored the redo of this bar is that like when they stock the back mm-hmm. bar, it's like there's Crown Royal, there's Tangare, there's Smirnoff. Yeah. There's Captain Morgan's and no other kinds of liquor. Oof. <laughs> Hope you like those choices, Upland. Tonight, let's yeah. get him back. Okay. Yeah. So uh it's the big reopen. The belly dancers are back. That's a big thing that they never address, like how they recruit talent, like who is producing the belly dance performances. Like they make a big deal of like roasting the costumes of the belly dancers at the beginning, but no comments about like how they revamped that as a program. I was really surprised by that aspect of this episode because I've got to admit, I've seen less than 20 episodes of Bar Rescue but a common issue tends to be grabby man. Oh, yeah. And wait staff or performer. And I so was like kind of pre-making the face of like, oh man, Gazi and Sam are gonna <laughs> grab a fucking belly dancer. Like I didn't want to see it. I didn't want to know. Like I didn't want that to be the truth of the problem here. And I'm glad that it wasn't. They they at least seem to be on the up and up yeah. like that. There is one grabby moment in this episode when it is right at the end. Ghazi is like at a table and there's like a SoCal surfer dude sitting at the table going like, hey, bro, give me a free drink or something. And Ghazi's got his like hand on the dude's shoulder as he's like checking in on the table. And the guy like reaches back and like moves the guy's hand away. Classic Ghazi. Yeah. Classic New Gazi, I should say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, New Gazi, who dis? Yeah. And uh, as we head out, you know, Taffer pats himself on the back for flipping this place around. And we learn that in the last six weeks, Minara has generated $72,000 plus dollars in new revenue. Gazi is not giving out free drinks anymore. And he and Sam are no longer fighting. It is a happy ending. It feels good. It does feel good. But did you feel good about this episode overall, Adam? I really did. Because as I said, like I have not seen a lot of Bar Rescue, but oftentimes the story either goes like, this manager uses his back office as a place to bang hookers <laughs> or like there's a horse being ridden through the bar and it takes a big dump in the kitchen area. Like the problems are huge, like larger right. than life huge <laughs> and often gross. And it was nice to see an episode where the problem was purely interpersonal and not dirty and gross. Like the most polluted part of this was the mindset that the owners had. It wasn't like gross and grabby. It wasn't particularly taking advantage of their service staff other than just like being bad managers who are directionless. But I think you get that in a lot of workplaces. Yeah, It was just like two guys in over their head who were fighting with each other. And in that way, it felt like a more innocent episode of Bar Rescue than I've typically watched. It was really fun to see a Star Trek actor in it. Like, even for it being such a brief amount of time, like, to see super cool and smooth Alexander Siddig walk in and get a shitty martini, like, (laughs) I would legitimately love to chat him up about what this experience is like because there's got to be more than what we've seen on screen. One of my favorite parts of... of that appearance was them saying like, yeah, I would never be caught fucking dead. Yeah. Out here. Yeah. Like in any other context. (laughs) Yeah. Like something that goes uncommented on is like they were in Morocco shooting tut, like they were in production, but probably 
eating and drinking like fucking kings out there. Yeah. For all six weeks of production, like, you know they were doing great. And like, what a bummer. It's got to be such a weird thing to be like eating and drinking like a king for six months and then smash back to what is nominally a first world country. And this is like the first thing you have to do. (laughs) God. Absolutely brutal. (laughs) But so true. Very fun experience, Ben, watching a bar rescue for Greatest Trek. What a delight. You know what else is a delightful experience, Adam, is uh, reading our Priority One messages. Do you want to get into the inbox? I'm heading right there directly. I'm about to uh, suck them through this tube, (laughs) which, I mean, remind me how you do at a a hookah bar. Do you go and like, do you rent the tip? Do you have to buy a tip? What happens when you do that? I think that they swap on a, a fresh tip. At a hookah bar. It's been. When was the last time you went? When I was in my 20s, I would do it occasionally in New York. There were a good number of hookah bars in New York and a couple of like fancy nightclub kind of ones that were also like, I don't know, like I've never really been a nightclub person, but. You don't say. I think when you are in your 20s in New York, you find yourself in one every so often. And yeah. I don't dislike a hookah experience. Do you get a hookah hangover the way you would if you smoked an entire cigar in an evening? I've been kind of reluctant to do that kind of activity for that reason. Yeah, I think you do a little bit. It's, yeah. um, I think you're not really supposed to inhale. Mm. Like a cigar, you're not supposed to inhale, but like I'm... You're still taking it in. The only things that I ever smoke, I you are supposed to inhale. Mm. Wink, wink, so... Mm. <laughs> Yeah, taking it off of the foil. Yeah. Priority one message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. Ben, our first priority one message is of a promotional nature. The message goes like this. Are you looking for some more pips? Do you hate working for a Jellico who micromanages your every move? You said it. Certified career coach Jessica Abbey will get your resume to glow your LinkedIn profile to stand out and arm you with the skills you need to face your interviews with confidence. Wow. So visit jabbycoaching.com. That's spelled J-A-E-B-I-C-O-A-C-H-I-N-G.com for a career boost that will supercharge your earning potential and help you find a job you love. This is a great service because- No kidding. The difference between a good interview and a fine interview means everything, I think. The jobs that I've gotten based off of just being charming in an interview, it means so much more than being qualified in every experience I've ever had that mattered. I really hope some friends of DeSoto get out from under their Jellicos and into some Picard situations based on this P1 because... uh, Yeah, nothing worse than spending, like, most of your waking hours in a shitty situation. So yeah, reach out to Jessica Abbey for this service. It's J-A-E-B-I coaching.com. Yeah, Jessica Abbey going for the greatest Trek bump. Yeah, well, it sounds like it's uh, Jessica Abbey's partner that arranged this P1. Hey, that's cool. Surprise bump. This is for She Who Is My Wife. It says here in the in the notes section. <laughs> hey, this is one surprise bump. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> the rare good surprise bump. Adam, our next P1 is from Gus. It's to Ben and Adam. It goes like this. Been catching up recently. Keep up the great job. Hope to make it to a Minneapolis show someday. Time for some drops. Sounds great. Fun will now commence. Incredible! How did you do that? There's coffee in that bathtub. Am I making any sense here? No way. This is fucking spectacular. (laughs) Out of time. Bye bye. Well, Gus just approached the P1 machine with all of the quarters. Yeah, no kidding. Expended all remaining drop ordinance on our pause. Yeah. Priority one messages are a great way to support the show. To have us say something that you want us to say, go to MaximumFun.org slash Jumbotron. 
Hey, Adam. What's that, Ben? Did you find yourself an Edward Larkin? Edward Larkin. Yeah, that guy that asks Gazi, he's like, the food's going to be free, right? <laughs> Knowing exactly who he's talking to. You referred to this guy earlier. He's yeah, the guy that Gazi puts his hands all over. Yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, you know, uh, if you're going to be touching me like that, <laughs> you should at least buy me a meal. You should at least buy me dinner. <laughs> and fucking Gazi says no and walks away. Wow. That guy is my Edward Larkin. What about you? Great Edward Larkin. When Alexander Siddig is sitting in the restaurant at the beginning, I noticed that one of those uh, Tyvek wristbands had been put on his wrist. Yeah. And I... I may be wrong, but what I interpreted that as is the palace had a bouncer working the night of the bar rescue surveillance shoot who carded Alexander Siddick <laughs> on his way into the restaurant and put a Tyvek wristband on him to show that he was eligible to purchase alcohol in this mixed use bar restaurant. And I just fucking love the idea that Alexander Siddick like cycles back to the world from Morocco after having been there for six months shooting this fucking show. And he's like, God damn it. I have this fucking contractual obligation. I have to drive out to fucking Upland and go in this fucking dog shit restaurant <laughs> and pretend I'm friends with John Taffer. I'm citizen of the world, Alexander Siddick. I have 14 different passports. You're going to fucking card me to have the world's shittiest martini at your bar? <laughs> <laughs> that I have to wait 20 minutes for? <laughs> Eat shit. <laughs> the indignity of that, Ben. You're so right. God. So I guess the bouncer that carded Ido Goldberg and Alexander Siddig is my <laughs> Edward Larkin. Tremendous Larkin. Wow. This was so much fun, man. Yeah. I yeah. had a great time talking about a very dumb TV show with you. We finally did it. Remind me what we have coming up next on Greatest Trek Spring Break. We are going to do a dive into Babs Alassane McCoon's resume with right. a Law & Order SVU episode called Retro. Dang. And I hope and believe that he will be in that episode for a greater runtime than Alexander Siddig was in Bar Rescue. <laughs> I really hope that's the case. Yeah. This one was definitely wedged in, you know, the skinny way because we were like, we just want to watch a Bar Rescue. Right. Thanks for bearing with us. This was a vanity episode for Ben and Adam. It's spring break, baby. Yeah, it's spring break. Uh, we really appreciate, yeah, for sticking with us through this seven weeks off. And we also really appreciate Wendy Pretty, who's going to take us out with some credits. Thanks, Wendy. Greatest Trek is an Oxbridge Shimoda podcast on the Maximum Fun Network. It's hosted by Ben Harrison and Adam Pranica, and it's produced by Wendy Pretty. This week, Adam jumped in to help finish the edit for this episode, so an extra thank you to him for just being the best. Next week, we'll be back on Friday with a review of Law & Order Special Victims Unit. That's Season 10, Episode 5, and it's available on the Peacock and Hulu in the U.S. Thank you to Adam Ragusia for composing all of the original music for this show. He has a podcast and a YouTube cooking channel that we highly recommend. Just search for Adam Ragusia. Thank you to Nick Dittmore for creating the show art and Bill Tilly for managing the at Greatest Trek social media pages on Instagram, Twitter, and Mastodon. Follow those accounts to stay up to date and use the hashtag Greatest Trek when you talk about the show online. If you're interested in the bonus content available to members, it's easy to set up a membership at MaximumFun.org slash join. And we really appreciate that. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week on Greatest Trek. MaximumFun.org. Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Audience supported.